there is no problem with that. We, we can interact with him, but also in Spanish. So thank you everybody to be here and Josh. Bueno, uh, muy buenas tardes a todos. Um, es un placer estar aquí con, con ustedes. Uh, unos disclaimers. Yo soy el director de un centro de investigación dentro de la, del Red Institute. Yo no soy el gran director. Um, y, y la idea para esta discusión sería hacer una conversación. Entonces, mi, mi estilo no es muy, muy formal. Y, eh, no sé, no soy un experto formal. Um, que, quiero hacer un, una conversación con ustedes porque yo creo que cada uno, cada uno de nosotros tiene su propia experiencia, su propio entendimiento de cosas como vamos a discutir. Entonces, la, la esperanza que yo tengo es una conversación abierta. Y voy a hablar más o menos en inglés. Yo, pero si hay algunas cosas que no entienden, voy a traducir a, a castellano. Perfecto, entonces, no sé lo que está pasando. ¿Cómo te lo cargo? The title for this talk is Developmental Evaluation, Tips, Tools, and Lessons Learned. Um, the, <coughs> everything about this will be an experiment. <laughs> RCTs, um, randomized control trials. 
And so we'll go through some of the tools that help us understand what development evaluation actually looks like. But the key takeaway here is it is quite different in its essence from traditional evaluation. So before we go into what it looks like in practice, why do we need it? If we've already got processes to manage our projects and to understand our projects and to measure our projects, why do we actually need developmental evaluation? Well, my argument is that the types of problems that we're encountering in our development problems, in our innovation systems, are quite different. We can think about problems in terms of our ability to understand and predict what happens in a system. So the most simple um, sorts of problems, cause and effect is very, very clear. It's very clearly articulated. I know that if I kick the ball, it will go that way at a certain speed um, for a certain distance. And so that's repeatable, it's perceivable, it's predictable. Not everything's so simple as that. And so a complicated problem or a complicated system, we can understand that cause and effect are linked, but we don't necessarily understand all the mechanics of it. Um, we can ultimately investigate and explore and understand what those mechanics are, but um, at the outset they're, they're a bit obscure. And so in both these complicated and simple problems, the boundaries and the, and the limits of the problem are clear. The problems are well understood by ourselves as well as the stakeholders. The problems and solutions behave in predictable ways, cause and effect are predictable and understandable. And because of that, there's a finite set of solutions. So there may be a hundred solutions, there may be a million solutions, but it's not a sort of NP complete problem. We can actually identify it what the solution set is, and which of these will be the optimal solution. And so if our system is behaving in this sort of predictable way, something like a traditional uh, logical approach makes sense. Here we have a problem, we understand it, we understand what the solution is, we start to implement steps and projects to incrementally make progress toward our desired solution. In a system like this, a logical framework approach makes complete sense. And so here we have a log frame with our objective that we're trying to achieve, what we think the causal linkages are, what we're trying to achieve, what sort of information we need to be able to measure progress, and the assumptions that underlie all of this logic. The problem is that increasingly we understand that very few problems are actually isolated and actually that simple or that sort of complicated nature. Rather, most of the problems we're facing, particularly in the development sphere and in the innovation sector, are complex at best, if not chaotic. And these are quite different systems or problem types than complicated and simple. Why? Because the boundaries and the limits of the problems aren't clear. We don't actually understand what the limits of the system are. If we don't understand what the limits of the system are, we don't understand who all the stakeholders are. And in fact, we can't determine, um, there's no stopping point on when someone becomes a stakeholder who's not a stakeholder. Think about something like, like global climate change, or think about deforestation in the Amazon, right? On its face, it could be a very simple problem. We can talk about deforestation in Colombia, who the stakeholders in Colombia are, who the multinational corporations impacting deforestation in Colombia are, very simple. But is that all the stakeholders? No, I'm breathing oxygen right now produced probably in the Amazon rainforest. And it probably in Colombia. And so am I a stakeholder in that problem? Yes. Um, does the forest help regulate the temperature and precipitation patterns here? Yes. Are you stakeholders? Yes. Are you direct stakeholders? That's a different question. The point is that in these complex problems, the boundaries aren't clear. Um, and with that many stakeholders and that many scales of interactions, um, the problems are, ne are necessarily defined uniquely by each stakeholder. So for someone in, in for a logger in Colombia, the problem is livelihood. For me as someone who's breathing the air produced by the rainforest in Colombia, the problem is much more about global temperature regulation and oxy oxygen production ecosystem services. And so we're defining the same problem very differently. Because of that, there's no 
there's no determinable solution set. Rather, there are infinite solutions because there are infinite problems. And because of all this, the dynamics and the interactions of these systems are inherently unpredictable. Um, the systems are, are connected in very complicated ways that have multi, multiple scales of interaction. And so all of this makes these problems very difficult to understand, let alone intervene in. Now that's sort of two ends of the two extremes on a, on a more continuous surface. In reality, a lot of our challenges that we're facing are development problems, innovation problems, behave in both of these ways. So I know that if I hire someone, they're going to have a livelihood. Um, do I know what the impact that livelihood is going to have on the wider community? No. And so in reality, we're on a, on a spectrum where at different scales, different parts of the problem are behaving in both of these ways. And so to go a little bit deeper in complex systems, um, the problems that we're facing are occurring in these systems that are interconnected, that are multi-nodal, um, and that are constantly dynamically changing over time. And so rather than just a, just a buzzword or a new sort of, um, a new sort of um, fad, uh, complex systems actually have some properties that make them mathematically understandable. Um, in terms of the network structure, the interconnectivity between nodes, um, complex systems behave in these nonlinear ways such that I instigate a change now and it's manifest in this way at this moment, it manifests in other ways at other moments at various unpredictable levels of intensity. Um, because of this interconnected and because of these nonlinear impacts, complex systems are multi-causal. That is to say that change comes from multiple directions in a complex system. And thus, the systems are in constant change, such that if I instigate a change here, it's going to ripple in across the system and manifest in different ways here and here. And those changes are going to ripple back through the system and cause the system to change again. So complex systems, it's not just a buzzword, they're actually mathematically complex. Add to that the problem of, of scale. In complex systems, you can't reduce the problem down to its core essence. Rather, the further you reduce something down in a very complicated pattern, you reduce it down, it, stays, it maintains that same level of complexity. If you reduce it down further, it maintains that same level of complexity. So a traditional sort of physics-based approach where you try and reduce a problem down to its core, core components, um, its cause and effect, isn't possible if these fractal patterns are happening. So think about um, stakeholders in a neighborhood land conflict. A uh, developer wants to come in and build an apartment building. You have a neighborhood association that says, no, we don't want that because X. But then if you go into the neighborhood association and ask each member, they want something different, they understand it a little differently. And then if you ask each person about the multiple perspectives they have on this problem, they in, inside themselves have the same level of complexity. And so this fractal nature of complex problems really just serves to reinforce the complexity of the system. And so whatever we try and do to address the problems that we're facing in the system, have to understand the cross-scale impacts, how changes in this scale manifest at this scale, or likewise how changes in this scale manifest across these different scales. Um, we have to understand how these scales relate to each other, and we have to build solutions that work across these different scales. So all that is to say that our development challenges aren't just complex, but they're actually what are defined in the urban planning literature as wicked problems, or the environmental management literature now as wicked problems. Wicked not meaning evil, not meaning unethical, but rather wicked meaning really difficult to solve because of all the complexity. <clears throat> and so when we think about a wicked problem, these again have certain mathematical um, conditions and mathematical properties. They're poorly defined, they're socially complex, 
They're constantly evolving because the system is constantly evolving. They're self-instigating such that any change here instigates another set of problems. So once we solve this problem, we've created a new problem that needs to be solved. Once we've solved a problem for this stakeholder, suddenly this stakeholder now has a different problem. And because of that, they're non-ending. So these, this cascade of problems doesn't have a stopping point. Rather, wicked problems aren't ever solved. Instead, they're resolved over and over and over and over again. So we implement a solution, it causes a new problem. We implement a solution, it causes a new problem. So we're constantly evolving as the system evolves. So how do we actually go about addressing a wicked problem then? if we can never actually solve it, if we can never identify the full number of stakeholders. Well, sort of good practice in solving wicked problems involves understanding who all the stakeholders are, who all the stakeholders are that are involved, at least at some, at some scale. So you have to make a decision around who to involve, who not to involve. Bring them together discover what each of their different perspectives are, what their definition of the problem is, what their objectives in the problem space are, what they're trying to get out of it, what resources they bring to it, what knowledge they bring to it. So it starts with just problem <coughs> definition among all the stakeholders, where you try and discover what the drivers are, what the dynamics are, how the stakeholders relate to each other and interact with each other, and then, Instead of imposing a solution, it's generating a solution through analysis and deliberation or conversation. Um, once you identify collectively, once you've co-created a potential solution, then you have some decision points. Who implements it? How is it implemented? At what scale? At what time frame is it implemented? Once you've made those decision points, then you start implementation, and then you have to ask, all right, <clears throat> Once we implement the solution, what happens? <clears throat> what happens at the moment we intervene? What happens after we intervene? Who else is involved? Who else needs to be involved? And why are these things happening? Why are these people now stakeholders? And so we're in a constant cycle of, of analysis, deliberation, implementation, and learning. And this cycle is really never ending. Sometimes these stakeholders stay constant, sometimes the public officials may drop off and a new set of stakeholders may join. But the, the point of this is that we're in this constant feedback process of learning, acting, and analyzing, and acting again. And so you can imagine then, if this is sort of our classic understanding of stakeholders and problem solution, where we have a project that has beneficiaries, um, that has a funding body, that has indirect or secondary beneficiaries. Um, that system, that way of understanding a problem space and an intervention doesn't work. Rather, if this is the way we're defining a proposed solution, then every one of these groups has to be a partner. They have to be able to come to the, the solution space as a partner, contribute their knowledge, contribute their resources, and benefit from other people's knowledge and resources. The idea is that collectively, we're more than the sum of the individual parts. And so it really changes the way that we conceptualize the innovation system or the development problem, because everyone suddenly becomes a partner in the intervention itself. That means then that there's not just an external evaluator that comes in with a logical framework to say, all right, are we measuring, are we making progress toward our specified goals? Rather, if everyone's contributing to the problem definition and the solution, then everyone's also generating some of the information needed across this process of learning. <clears throat> and so it requires then a different a different mental framework for thinking about monitoring, evaluation, and learning. The entire goal of the process should be learning. Um, because if we just implement and evaluate, then we're stuck here. Meanwhile, the system continues to change, generate new problems that we're not 
identifying or responding to. And so this is just to say that um, in that context, traditional monitoring and evaluation has certain blind spots. This approach is really good for what it's good for, the logical framework. Really great for exactly what the logical framework is good for, but bad for the other things. Specifically because of some of those system dynamics that I talked about. So um, these complex systems and interventions in complex systems manifest the same sort of nonlinearity. We need to be able to evaluate the nonlinear impacts, um, the cross-scale impacts, and importantly, the unintended consequences of our, of our actions. So a log frame is good for measuring our overall objective. It's good for measuring progress toward that objective. It's not good for measuring anything else that happens. So we need to uh, create a process to measure those unexpected changes. A log frame is really good for understanding um, who's responsible for an impact, who's responsible for an intervention or a component of an intervention. But the reality is that in that complex system, there are many actors doing many things that are all causing changes at the same time. And so there are multiple types of change happening. That makes it really difficult to say with any certainty that our intervention caused the change that we're seeing. Rather, it contributes to the change we're seeing, but can we say, can we attribute our change or our impact to change? Um, can we impact, uh, can we really attribute our action to the change that we're seeing? And the reality is that it's not one or the other, but it's multi-causal. Multiple things are causing the change that we're seeing manifest in the real world. So we need processes to measure not just our pre-specified objectives, but all of these different um, sorts of change that are happening. And finally, some of the things we're trying to do are simply not observable. Think about something like a project trying to prevent conflict. Can you measure conflict not happening and attribute to, um, to your intervention? Very difficult, right? And particularly in the traditional approach, impossible. And so what we need to do then, if we understand that the system is behaving in some predictable ways, but some complex ways also, we need to create a deliberative learning ecosystem. That is to say that we need to compile together multiple methods to understand what is predictable and what's not predictable, to make sense of what is happening and look back retrospectively to try and understand what happened. And so that means that we do need, we don't just leave our traditional monitoring and evaluation. We don't just cast it aside and say, with log frames, you know, you're dead to me. Rather, <laughs> we use them where they're good. Um, and we couple them with other processes that are good at, at answering those other questions, right? And so we need the output, the product-oriented or performance-oriented methods. But we also need methods to understand our process as we're implementing, because if we're really stuck in that, that cycle of learning, action, adaptation, then we need to understand that, that process as it evolves. Hence the name um, developmental or evolutiva, evaluation evolutiva. Um, and so this type of, of process, or this type of evaluation, monitoring evaluation, allows for emergent outcomes. Um, allows for more continuous data collection um, across that entire part process with the partners who are involved in it. And importantly, it situates the results that we're seeing, the changes that we're seeing, in what's happening across this process. All right, so development, developmental evaluation process-oriented method. Why do we need it? Because systems behave in predictable and unpredictable ways. So, if those things are true, which I hope you'll suspend disbelief and think that they are for a moment, um, what are some useful tools? Well, a lot of people have been thinking about this for a long time, and there are guides and guides and guides and lists and lists and lists of tools that have been developed that are very useful. Um, a few years ago, in 
Uh, sorry, I have the wrong date. That's 2016. In 2016, um, USAID contracted Johns Hopkins University and a uh, coalition of international organizations to go through the existing developmental evaluation literature. And they put out a guide that um, goes over all of the different tools um, that have been developed and tested in real world interventions and put together this really sort of exhaustive and not terribly boring guide on using <laughs> um, And they group them into just simple visualization methods um, that use sort of uh, qualitative mapping, visualization methods that use quantitative modeling, narrative-based approaches, and then indicator-based approaches. And so all this is to say that while we're focused on process-oriented methods, you're not stuck at just qualitative analysis without indicators, without the ability to observe. Rather, um, different tools have been developed to help you uh, in different, different moments across that project pipeline and that learning pipeline. Um, I'm not going to go over all of these because it would be terribly boring. What I will do instead is go over the tools that we've developed for the Works for Progress program. Um, who all, how many of you know what the Works for Progress program is? You've heard of the movies. Okay, I won't bore you too much with it. But for those who don't know, the Works for Progress program is a program funded by uh, Fundacion La Caixa. Um, that's a long-term development program uh, that's intended to generate investment in entrepreneurship and job creation in three countries, in India, Mozambique, and Peru. And we're fortunate to have our colleagues from India here who I hope, I hope will join me in explaining this program. But the idea behind the Works for Progress program is to really take a platform approach, to understand that there are multiple stakeholders, including funders, including project teams on the ground, including what would have been beneficiaries who are now participants and partners in the program, uh, and to work as a platform to try and increase jobs and, and livelihoods and entrepreneurship in these three countries. And so the methodology is basically the following. You start with a big listening phase, a big conversation with the people involved in the area. Try and understand who they are, what, they, what resources they have, what resources they want, what jobs they already have, what jobs they want, um, their vision of the world. Um, and together, for the entire platform, envision a world that is possible. And you do that through a phase of co-creation. So once you've tried to map out all the stakeholders, map out all the resources, map out the goals, objectives, dreams, um, go through a process of co-creation. What can we actually do as a platform to increase jobs and livelihoods and entrepreneurship? Through that process of co-creation or envisioning, you come up with several candidate interventions. So we think we can do this and this and this. We probably can't do all these other things, but at least these things we can do. And so then you try experimenting with them, see how it works on the ground. Um, the prototypes that actually work and turn out to be promising and get accelerated. And in the communities that they're working in, you try and go deeper to involve more people, um, magnify the impact. And then ultimately continue to provide support in adaptive ways. So the question then, coming back to developmental evaluation, is how can each of these very different platforms in very different geographies understand their own wicked systems or wicked problems? And, importantly for Lakaisha, how can we understand or compare across these wildly different cases? So, as I said, each platform understands this, the complexity that they're working in, and they've developed sort of, I won't say traditional, but they've developed dashboards and processes for monitoring and evaluation that they can use to follow their, their interventions. But the question is what sorts of, these are predominantly, I won't say entirely output focused, but there is a focus on outputs as there used to be. But what are, the, what are the developmental evaluation tools that can help us understand the process that they're going through? Well, to do that, um, we've developed a sort of 
global evaluation or macro evaluation that's trying to understand um, these interventions according to six sort of criteria. Does participation in an innovation platform lead to tangible goods, tangible benefits for the communities that host them? Are the prototypes that are developed for that co-creation phase actually responding to the needs that are identified by the communities themselves and the platform members? How do the networks and the platforms adapt to changes? Because remember, the system is constantly changing. Once we do one action, the system changes. So how do we adapt to that change? Um, in societies, we already have relationships negotiated among us, right? We have, all of us in this room have a relationship negotiated. I'm up here talking, you're listening very patiently, uh, thank you. Um, as soon as something changes though, we, re we have to renegotiate those relationships. So if the power suddenly shuts off, we're going to change the way we're interacting. Um, so too, as the platforms start to work, they start to change and those relationships have to get renegotiated. So how do those relationships change? Um, how does this type of intervention affect the wider communities? And finally, what do we need to learn from this whole system to better tailor an innovation platform uh, approach? So a lot to a lot to to try and monitor, evaluate, and learn from. <coughs> and we've got several tools to help us through that. I've already showed the or alluded to the fact that there are these dashboards and frameworks to understand some of the outputs. And we've coupled those with, with three, with four tools that I want to talk about just very briefly. Um, I'll go through each one independently to show sort of what role it plays. But keep in mind these questions. Are we responding to the needs that are identified? How are we adapting to change? Um, how does it affect interactions and relationships? How does it affect the wider system? So the first tool I want to I want to go through is just a very simple matrix that we're calling the needs and bear, the needs and opportunities matrix. So what it does through that process of engagement with communities, you start to identify this is a need that this community has, this is a need that this community has, this is a resource that this other community has. So you start to map out what the needs and resources in the system are um, in a traditional sort of developmental development project a lot of that information gets lost um, and as soon as you lose that information it's pretty much gone it's no longer a priority so the idea for this matrix is to keep that information on hand and as the system starts to change to continue to build out what are the new needs that are emerging, what are the new opportunities that are emerging. Identify where we're, where in the process we're seeing those emerge, whether it's in the listening phase, the co-creation phase, the prototyping phase. And then to map how our prototypes respond to the needs or utilize the opportunities, capitalize on the opportunities. Um, so it's not just that there is this need, but we're actually trying to respond to it in this way and in this way. Or this prototype is responding simultaneously to this need and this need and this need. And finally, here, to put a description of that causal linkage. Why do we think that this prototype responds to this need? How is this prototype responding to this opportunity or using that opportunity? And so the goal for this really, really simple, not earth-shattering tool, um, is to try and understand how our interventions are logically connected. Now, systems constantly changing as soon as we implement an action, or if we just wait and let the world turn, change will happen. Um, so the question is, what changes that people are experiencing are actually important to understand? Which of those are significant? So the second tool is we know here that we're trying to in instigate change. We're trying to implement something that will change the system. So this tool asks, are those changes significant? How are they impacting people's lives or the ecosystem more broadly? At its core, this is a method of just asking 
people in the platform, what's happening in your life? Is it, what has changed? Uh, over the last month, what has changed? What's changed in terms of your livelihood? What's changed in terms of your family, familial relationships? What's changed in terms of the way you're running your business? What has changed? And then, I'll go through the matrix in a second, but what's changed and why do you think it's important? So the logic behind this tool is for information on change to be collected really at the, the participant level, the partners who are involved in the process, to, to monitor what changes they're seeing in their life. And then for that information to pass up through the layers of the organization. So here we have the prototypes, we have the platform members who are supporting the prototypes, we have the member organizations, then we have the country team more broadly, and finally we have the entire three country portfolio. So the idea is for information about change to flow up through, the, through these layers, and then for feedback about the change to flow back down through through those layers. And that feedback can come in the form of just reporting and conversation. It can also come in the form of decisions that are made or actions that are taken that respond to those changes. But the idea here is to understand at the individual level and at the community level what sorts of changes are happening and why do the people who are experiencing those changes think they're significant? As a platform, then, you discuss what those changes are, why they're significant, and what that means for your work, and then decide what actions should we take based on, the, based on these two things, the change and the ways that the change matters. What should we do? And then to add another layer of reflection and learning to say, what have we learned about our intervention? And the idea is to keep this as a living tool, to continue to have these discussions around change periodically, to understand in not real time, but near real time, what is happening, what does it mean for people, and to revisit these over time to say, this had changed, now what's happened to it. And so the third tool then is meant to build on that tool, to say, what are the factors that really create obstacles or barriers to change in the system, to our ability to positively impact the system. What are the barriers to that? And what are the factors that enable change or um, magnify, amplify change? So here again, as, as members of the platforms who are supporting the prototypes, as you go through that implementation phase, what factors are you seeing that either inhibit or um, amplify your ability to do your work? Once you identify all those factors, it can just be a list of factors and suddenly everything becomes important. So how do you distinguish between what you need to respond to, um, either because it's really urgent, it's really pressing, or because it has a really big impact? And so there's a simple scoring tool to help identify there is this, this impact, and it's really urgent, and it's really impactful, or this factor, it's really super negative, on our intervention, and it's happening quite immediately. So we need to respond to this. Versus something down here that's you know not really going to have a big impact, and not really going to manifest anytime soon, we might not need to respond to that. But it's a discussion for the platform members and the, and the participants themselves. What do we need to respond to? And so here, the next piece of the logic is, once you've decided what you know, what's helping and hurting your intervention, how important it is, how do we want to adapt to it? And so over time, as you build this out, you start with, this is how we're gonna adapt today. In three months, this is how we're gonna change our, how we're gonna change our strategy to respond to this factor. In another three months, this is how we're gonna respond to it now. And so the idea is to keep a living conversation of these things. Um, and the goal for having, or, on its face, this can seem like a lot, right? You're tracking needs and opportunities, you're tracking change, you're tracking barriers and enablers. So the logic of the tools is to have something very simple that's not labor intensive, that you can quickly systematize um, and coordinate the information, and then update uh, without a lot of effort. 
And the idea then is over the course of a year to really build out your understanding of your intervention uh, through this iterative process of learning, uh, learning, adapting, implementing, learning, analyzing. And then over the course of years to really build, build out a systematic and um, deep understanding of the platform, the communities, the relationship between them. And the final tool is what's called Sentinel Indicators. So we know that through these tools, we know a lot about what's happening in our intervention. The question is what's happening in the wider system. So we know that we're trying to increase agricultural output. And it's really good in this way, in this way, in this way, but there's a lot of there are a lot of climatic factors and structural factors that impact the system. And so are there certain indicators that we need to track to be able to understand what's happening and what changes we can expect? So if we have, for instance, um, an agricultural project, do we need to be tracking weather forecasts to understand if there's a potential drought? when the drought might happen, if it's going to be an El Nino year, what that means in terms of our ability to grow this crop versus another crop. And so this final tool is meant for a later period. Once you've gone through some learning, a year, two years maybe, you understand a lot about how the system works, you can start to identify what are the other factors that we need to be monitoring. We don't have control over, we're not directly influencing, but we need to monitor. And so in that sense, we're <coughs> collecting information about our intervention, about our adaptation, and the wider system broadly. So examples of these might be, of these sentinel indicators might be something like rainfall, consumer price levels, something more uh, profound like mal malnutrition rates and prevalence. Um, the idea is to understand what in the system is externally impacting the intervention. All right, so the last slide in this presentation is just some basic rules of good practice. So we know that um, we've got some tools we're trying to develop. How do we do them well? Well, for conducting a developmental evaluation, we really need to develop these tools that work using multiple methods that work on multiple timescales, and we need to include intentional discussions among the project team and the beneficiaries or participants or partners to really process this information. We need to create a learning network. The partners who are involved explicitly in evaluation need a certain objectivity. They need to be a little bit removed to be able to look at global patterns or, or macro patterns. But because they're also partners, they need a certain proximity and investment in the process. So when you think about any of those three matrix, matrices, you can imagine they're labor intensive a little bit, which requires a certain dedication and devotion. If I'm an external evaluator and really have no personal investment in this process going well, I may or may not encourage the teams on the ground to continue to fill out the matrix and continue to have discussions around it. But if I'm really invested personally, if I'm closer to the project, then I'm invested in the outcomes and I'm invested in understanding the data, feeding it back into the project so that the project goes better. So evaluation partners, instead of being totally removed, like a traditional evaluation might have them, they're really embedded in the, in the project. Because everybody's a partner in this, because everybody's got a responsibility to implement and everybody's experiencing change, um, everybody's busy, right? I think about my own life, I'm not that busy, but I'm kind of busy. Um, but I really don't have a lot of time to be filling out forms and discussing them in depth, but it's really important that I do. So it's important that whatever tools we build are cost efficient and cost effective in terms of people's time, in terms of the financial resources, in terms of um, all of the different sorts of uh, investment that people are putting in. So time, energy, economy, investment. We need to make sure that there's a high return on investment for, um, for this evaluation process, and that overall there's a social return on investment, meaning that 
we understand how to do our intervention better, and we understand also how to work better together. So it has to manifest itself in real results. That requires then that maybe we give up a little bit of the pure rigor, the scientific rigor, because already we know we can't understand and predict what's happening. So the question is, to what degree do we need to be really, really pure in our analysis? Do we need something like a randomized control trial, really scientifically pure? Do we need something really just quick and qualitative that gives us an overall sense of the intervention? There's probably a balance here. Um, there's probably some good balance that we need to strike between rigor and cost effectiveness. And finally, the, good, the best, the best of good practices, I think, are is that we really need to change our mentality away from from individual division of labor, me as implementer, you as beneficiary, you as donor, to all of us as partners in this ecosystem, so that we can create that deliberative, adaptive learning network that, that I described earlier. So there are a lot of images from some of the guidebooks and some of the tools, and here are the references, not plagiarizing. <coughs> um, and with that, I'd love to open it up to conversation or discussion. Any questions?